Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I am very excited to introduce you today to Dr. Dan Greenberg. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher in Bryce Simmons lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He started in the lab about a year ago and ever since we have been meeting with him virtually um, while he's in Canada and that's where he is today. Um, lots of cool things about Dan. I'll just state a, a few of the highlights. So he received his PhD from Simon Fraser uh, University in Vancouver, Canada, where he studied evolutionary patterns in amphibians and how those patterns relate to um, species susceptibility to a variety of threats like disease, habitat loss, climate change. Um, and he's tracked blue iguana at the Grand Cayman Island. And more recently in 2018, 2019, he led uh, field studies where he was looking at um, biodiversity surveys of amphibians and reptiles in Ethiopia on relic forest, fragmented forests uh, associated with Orthodox churches. So I'm hoping that I got that right. Obviously, um, Dan is a terrestrial guy and we're super excited that he has decided to get his feet wet, so to speak, and inform us today about what he's learned about citizen science surveys and how robust they are at um, uh, actually um, demonstrating population, actual population trends in coral reef fishes. So um, without further ado, thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys all day. Thanks for coming. It is uh, my first marine biology seminar, so that's extra exciting for me. Um, without further ado, I'm going to get right into it. So, so this is uh, one image of our planet today. Um, humans have been all over the world for a long time now, tens of thousands of years. Um, but within the past uh, 150 or so, uh, with the rise of industrialization, our impacts and our population growth has accelerated uh, extremely rapidly. Um, there's very few places that are minimally impacted um, still on Earth. It's a wilderness area is only about less than a quarter of the Earth's surface um, has essentially no direct impacts. All of them have indirect impacts. Um, and not only does our sort of ecological dominance uh, completely take over Earth's terrestrial surfaces, but also uh, we have pretty much dominated the oceans as well. So given the really rapid and sort of unprecedented environmental changes that have occurred over the last several hundred years, a major question with sort of direct societal relevance is, well, given that we, uh, we are essentially the masters of all ecosystems now, how are other species, non-human species, actually faring under this? Um, this is probably one of the biggest questions in conservation biology. And of course, it also has direct relevance for uh, policy um, implications for things like uh, IG biodiversity targets uh, from the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, this is also a question that I've thought about. Um, and so I wanted to kind of dig into this a little bit. So a really key piece of data um, to answer this question are time series. Um, so these are tracking, you know, changes in ecological dynamics over long periods of time so that we can actually see how states are changing. Um, these could be in terms of community levels, so like species richness in an area. Um, I'm going to focus on population time series. So here you can see a time series of, of abundance. Um, they can vary in, in their length. And generally, these, are, these can be described with some sort of simple uh, demographic equations. So the, the abundance at any time point is basically going to depend on the abundance in its previous time point, plus the, the annual growth rate, which is you know reflecting demographic changes in terms of births and deaths. Or well, if we rearrange this to look at just at population change, then we can basically take it as the log ratio of uh, abundance in one time set versus another. Um, populations naturally fluctuate, and mostly what we're interested in is long-term trends. So there's many different ways to calculate population trends. Uh, two common ways would be taking the geometric mean, um, and it's the geometric mean because uh, growth is multiplicative, uh, so it's changing the, the principle or the number of individuals, which in turn influences growth. Um, so you could take the mean of the population growth rate, geometric mean, or another option is sort of the slope of uh, log abundance against year. Uh, 
such as indicated by this line. So this is sort of the key piece of data to figure out, okay, how are populations actually changing? Are trends negative or positive, um, given that we expect that you know, things are getting worse? So there's been some major um, undertakings to try and ask this at really broad global scales. So probably the biggest and most influential one is the Living Planet Index. Um, so they've compiled a population time series for nearly 30,000 vertebrate populations, representing almost 5,000 species. Um, and they've kind of released these uh, biannual reports on you know, how the uh, planet is doing in terms of vertebrate population abundance. So what they do is you, know, you have all these different time series, they have different lengths, they start at different times. And for any given year where they have populations, they're essentially taking the geometric mean of all the growth rates of the population that year um, to get a sort of composite average growth rate. Then they take their index, which starts at one in 1970, and basically just grow the index according to the, um, to the average growth rate. Um, they do some additional things like weighting um, the contribution to the mean based on how much diversity of given population or species represents. Um, but that's the same sort of general concept. And based on their findings across these you know, thousands of populations, they indicate a pretty dire situation. So their analysis suggests that about two thirds of, uh, of average abundance uh, has been lost across the average species. So that's an incredibly dire statistic. Um, this is for the average species. That means that many more will be much worse, some will be much better. Um, but this suggests that things are, are getting pretty bad over the past um, five decades. But uh, this is a number that's still very much up for debate. There have been other studies on this, um, asking this at global scales. Uh, another big database uh, that compiles all this is the BioTime database. Um, so they kind of have similar sort of data where it's time series of either um, community level uh, data or population change. Uh, in this paper, uh, they show population change um, across all these different groups for about 25,000 populations. And they come up with a very different pattern. So what they're suggesting is actually rather than, you know, two thirds of the abundance, so a pretty rapid rate of population decline being on the average, their average rate of change is centered pretty much on zero. So it's basically balanced between declining populations on one side and growing populations on the other. And this seems to be the case both across different taxonomic groups and also in different uh, sort of biological realms across the world. Um, needless to say, this has been a bit of a controversial finding. Um, I started working on something about this like this um, many years ago during my master's. I was studying amphibian population dynamics. And uh, at the time, uh, there was a lot of studies suggesting that amph globally amphibian populations were declining. We wanted to know whether they were declining faster than other groups or rather they were just one of many different declines going on. Um, so we started uh, working with population time series from all these different uh, vertebrate classes. Um, we did it in a couple different data sets initially, but eventually ended up using the Living Planet database. Uh, we focused on just temperate groups, so in uh, North America and Europe, mostly because this is where the vast majority of like good quality data is. Um, and so we had time series for about 5,000 uh, populations and about 1,000 species. And uh, this, this is just terrestrial and freshwater, um, no marine. What we found um, was sort of surprising to us, uh, especially given what we knew from the Living Planet Report, which was, well, indeed, amphibian populations on average seem to be significantly declining at a rate of about 2% per year across uh, all the populations. But for the other groups, uh, it was kind of a different story. We were expecting everything to be, you know, on average declining, but instead, uh, mammals, reptiles seem to be increasing, and it was about stable for fish and bird populations. And this is in the same data set. So this was a, a bit confusing and um, we thought, well, okay, maybe it's just because in temperate regions, you know, there's actually many reasons to suspect things actually are getting better. Um, forests have actually regrown in, in much parts of, the, of North America and Europe over the past couple decades. Uh, there's better wildlife management and environmental regulations in many respects, uh, endangered species legislation, et cetera. Um, so maybe it's just a temperate thing. Some collaborators we were working with though, um, kind of did a similar study, uh, but they looked at everywhere in the world. Um, and what they found was sort of the same thing is that it doesn't really matter what latitude you are. So this mu here is the population trend, negative being declined, positive being increased. And it sort of didn't matter where you are, were on earth or whether you were freshwater, marine or terrestrial, um, 
Globally, in aggregate, it seemed to be balanced, uh, similar to the McGill et al. study from the Biotime database. So we were sort of interested, because we were working on this, uh, to really figure out, well, what, what's actually going on? How can we come up with these two very different estimates um, from these different methodologies? And so we started digging into this to really get a, try and get a better estimate about, okay, what's actually going on with the state of the world's vertebrate populations? So how can we reconcile these disparate estimates? So the first thing we noticed was that time series length uh, makes a big difference. So both in our study and in the uh, Gurgana Daskalova study at the global scale, they, we only used time series of about five years. So that was about here. Um, the variance in population trends, so this uh, population trends is on the Y here, um, gets much, much, much larger at, at short time series. So you get really extreme uh, rates of population growth and really extreme rates of population decline when you only study a population for a couple of years. Um, this makes sense, of course, because you cannot sustain uh, really extreme uh, growth or decline over long terms. Um, just to give you a point of reference, like a, a log growth rate of negative three is about a 95% annual decline. So this is basically like a snapshot of complete extinction. Um, but of course, the longer that you actually study something, the more moderate the trends tend to be. Um, so perhaps it was merely just a function of time series length. But what we started exploring too is, well, what, what do these extreme values actually do when we um, do the same method as a living planet index? So we recreated this. So this is using the living planet index data um, for about 16,000, 15,000 populations. And what we noticed was, well, it turns out that the methodology where you take the geometric average, it's very, very sensitive to extreme values. So if you, you know, just keep all the populations, we get a similar sort of two thirds decline. Um, but if we start removing the most negative population, so these, these ones down here, um, it doesn't take very long for you to completely flip the entire sign of this pattern. Um, indeed, removing about 2% of the populations from the data set makes this sort of two-thirds decline become about a net change of zero. Um, and the same thing happens if you remove the positive uh, things, is that it will go even further down. Um, interestingly, there seems to be far more short negative rapid declines than there are short positive sort of eruptions. Um, so this sort of helps reconcile a little bit about what maybe is going on um, in terms of how we can get the same, very different sort of uh, inferences from the same data set. But the other thing that we wanted to do is say, okay, well, can we potentially improve upon this? So we sort of developed these different scenarios um, that we eventually applied into a model. And so the sort of scenario that we generally think of when we're thinking of biodiversity decline, decline is that, okay, you know, most populations in a community um, maybe are declining, some are doing all right. So the sort of overall trend is, is negative. If, however, there's this sort of separate trend where the mean might be about the same, but most of them are actually, there's about an equal number that are, you know, increasing or declining, but then there's a sort of extra little separate group that maybe are just particularly not doing well under human conditions. Um, so this is like an, a, an extreme separate cluster. In the same way, you could also have a, a separate a positive cluster or the entire um, community could be, you know, increasing. So we were able to sort of take this framework and build it into a, a what we call this sort of Bayesian, Bayesian hierarchical mixture model. So basically we're taking all these individual time series and we're looking at growth rates again um, over time. And instead of uh, just simply averaging the growth rates, we instead say, okay, well, let's, you know, make this hierarchical, we'll, we'll regularize across different scales. So first we assume that, okay, these growth rates are coming from, you know, some distribution where you have an overall trend, but then also this sort of interannual fluctuation. So that sort of pools together that data. And these trends themselves actually come from a bigger distribution, which is from, you know, what the entire community is doing. So these hyperparameters that sort of um, uh, theta and tau describe the sort of mean uh, for the entire community and then the, the amount of variance. And so we looked at this by kind of combining together what we called systems. So basically it's like a taxonomic class, so like, uh, you know, mammals, plus a biome, freshwater, terrestrial, marine, um, and the realm. So, you know, Nearctic, Palearctic, um, uh, Neotropic, et cetera. 
And then basically we contrast sort of different models where we try and fit you know, a single um, distribution, so a single mean and a single uh, uh, variance based on the growth rates, or you can have different separate distributions. So this is where the mixture part comes in. So there could be separate distributions with their own um, within the same system. So there could be a separate extreme decline group and then a sort of main mixture and then a separate um, positive group even. Um, so in this way, we could kind of isolate out these extreme um, declines or extreme growth rates um, to get a sort of better picture at like what's the most representative um, amount of change for the sort of main mass of populations in each system. So we did this and applied this across all these different groups. And here's uh, just for terrestrial systems, um, showing sort of you know what the actual main um, uh, system-wide trend is doing. The little asterisks here indicate the presence of either an extreme, uh, you know, positive group or an extreme negative group on this end. Um, and what you can see is, okay, so most things are sort of broadly centered um, on about zero, some slight differences, so some, you know, weekly increasing, some uh, weekly decreasing. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity across both taxonomic groups and across realms. Um, and so we applying this, it, it sort of teases apart all these different things that are going on, um, but then also lets us build them back all together and then ask, okay, what's the overall distribution across the entire world, across these 57 systems? And what we end up with is a, is a sort of global composite that looks like this. So this is all the different um, sort of growth rates from all these different systems. And we classified each system as either, you know, being sort of no, generally no change. So that's this sort of light yellow group here. Um, systems that had sort of a decline, but the, the sort of confidence intervals on that cross zero, so we can't be entirely sure. And then groups that seem to be sort of strongly and consistently declining. And as it turns out, there's about 10 of these systems um, that show these really broad declines here. Within these systems, about 87% of the populations were declining, so that's really um, quite concerning. And for the remaining systems that were, you know, presumably stable based on the data we have, about 15% of these, so that would be this sort of share here, um, left at these bars, um, were also strongly declining. So this is sort of like somewhere in between the sort of living planet index and, and what some of these other papers have been reporting where yeah, there's sort of this like overall global balance, but then there's also this like second multimodal hump of places and and taxonomic groups that are just doing really, really bad. Um, and of course, this is concerning. This is basically saying that, you know, 20% of these like very broad, you know, systems are potentially suffering some really negative declines. So having just gone through this, um, I, I, I guess I'll state this publicly that I think that all of these um, pictures that I've painted of, you know, how the Earth's vertebrates are doing are almost certainly wrong. Um, you know, we're aggregating this data. The data sets themselves are, are really good um, in, in terms of how much data they're integrating, um, but sadly it's just not enough and it's, it's probably not sufficient. And I'll give you my reasoning why. The populations and species that we tend to have this long-term data for, so it's quite hard to actually, you know, get a time series for, for a population. Uh, it requires a lot of effort, a lot of investment, um, and these data are quite rare. That's why the majority of them were only, you know, less than five years in length. Um, you know, if we look at this map of where some of the populations in the Living Planet database are coming from, yeah, it's, it's, it looks pretty good. There's a lot of coverage in Europe, a lot of coverage in North America. There's also just vast areas of the globe where there's no populations. And even in these areas that are pretty richly populated with time series, uh, the, this, the, the sample of, of populations and species that we're drawing from is probably not fully representative. We generally have data for, for things that we like to either hunt or fish. Uh, we have generally have data for species that are incredibly widespread. Um, or we have data on populations that tend to exist in generally like pretty well-off ecosystems. So they're either protected areas, uh, ecological research reserves, et cetera. These are the places where people actually sort of tend to establish long-term studies. And, you know, even though these databases are massive, uh, to ask this question on such a really broad spatial and temporal scale, 
unfortunately just requires way, way, way more data. Um, so I think that we really can't actually get a grasp on this currently. Um, and this really sort of underscores that we, we just haven't made the right investments um, into collecting this sort of basic ecological biodiversity data to really uh, have an informed picture about what's going on um, in all these ecosystems. It could be true in some places where there are sort of long-term monitoring programs, but for the vast majority of Earth, it's definitely not going to be the case. Now, with that said, um, I think there's a lot of hope to be had around this. Um, and the hope is in the terms of these sort of massive uh, citizen science initiatives that are popping up all over the globe, and many of them are global in scale. Um, here's just a small sampling of the different ones uh, that have been established and are really growing over um, the last couple decades. And uh, I think that really to get to answer this question with any sort of accuracy, we're basically going to have to use uh, citizen science data. Um, and I'll, I'll try and convince you that this potentially can fill this massive data gap. So data from citizen science programs are really accumulating rapidly um, and quite globally. So in this study, uh, they looked at uh, the GBIF records. So these are um, the biodiversity informatics database. And that has records of things like um, sort of museum records where people have collected something, but also occurrences. And uh, they've also included eBird records in this. And uh, in this study, they were able to show how um, basically the GBIF records uh, for birds have grown uh, with and without the, the presence of eBird records. So the shaded area for all these different regions, so this is in the Arctic, um, neotropics, um, that represents the additional records um, put in just by eBird. And basically, if you look at this, you can see that almost all the, the increases uh, in many of these areas, especially in the sort of generally poorly studied areas, are almost entirely coming from citizen science data in terms of eBird. Uh, and if you compare this to basically everything that isn't a bird, uh, the growth rate in terms of the number of records is pales in comparison to what uh, the bird data are accumulating. So this is completely changing uh, how um, data is covered across the globe. And it really is um, expanding uh, the data available for regions that, are, that basically don't have a lot of scientific capacity. Um, here you can see a plot of the sort of exponential growth of eBird um, after it goes global. Um, and I found, thought this map was super interesting because it shows uh, the sort of bird populations from the Living Planet Index on the top panel here, uh, and then the bird records from uh, GBIF, including eBird. Um, very scant sample in Living Planet Index, but uh, GBIF is now seemingly covering nearly everything. Um, so this seems like it has a huge potential, but the unfortunate Thing that we have to take into account and that I think a lot of people are incredulous about in terms of citizen science data is that it generally comes with its caveats. So citizen science data um, isn't exclusively but often is sort of opportunistic. So that mean, what that means is it's not structured, um, you're not going on a specific survey but rather you're just encountering things as you encounter them in nature. Not all of them are opportunistic so a good example would be uh, the North American Breeding Birds Survey, um, which is one of the best structured data sets uh, for any you know, population change that exists anywhere in the world. Um, and that's volunteer driven, but it's structured. So people go on set routes and have sort of set um, protocols. Um, but let's just compare some of the real differences. So when you establish you know, a systematic monitoring survey, generally you try and keep effort uh, constant for both across observers and across years and across sites. Not, not the case in opportunistic surveys. There could be one super keen person, there could be regions that are just incredibly, um, you know, have a lot of effort dedicated to them. Um, generally, you try and randomize your samples in some sort of way. Uh, certainly, uh, in opportunistic data, it's very, very non-random. People go out for, to go see specific ecosystems, specific sites, uh, to find specific species. They're seeking things out. It's human behavior. Um, generally, when you have multiple observers, you try and you know, minimize those differences by having some sort of common training in the methodology um, so that things are consistent across the different people. 
uh, in citizen science data, observer skills is going to be highly variable. Some people are going to be experts at picking out a bird uh, based on song or sight or whatever. Uh, other people will, you know, not be able to identify a robin, but they'll be contributing to, to this data set in the same way. So you'll have misidentifications in some case, you'll have all these different sort of uh, differences in ability. And generally, we try and make our structured surveys um, designed to reduce human-induced biases. That's why we randomize, um, so they're, we're not always going to the best sites. Um, human behavior and biases are basically like inherent to citizen science data. So these are all things that potentially serve as factors that make it hard to ever think that maybe citizen science data could be used to get sort of that same sort of level of standardized time series. Um, but people are trying and, and there's the potential to actually correct for all these things. And, and maybe that actually might make them comparable and useful. So the big question is, well, despite all these biases then, um, will it agree with traditional sur uh, surveys? Uh, there's been a few tests of this. I'm going to go through one um, with eBird again because this is, you know, that's where people are doing all of, most of the majority of the work of this stuff right now. Um, in this study, they looked at sort of trends based on eBird data, so sort of uh, probability of encountering a, a given bird. They correct for a bunch of things like effort um, in the model, and then they basically ask whether the long-term trend um, fits with the estimates given by BirdLife International. So that's kind of like the IUCN body for birds. Um, and whether they sort of, you know, if it's a positive trend, does it agree with a positive trend um, from bird life? And what they found um, across these different time periods is that actually only slightly less than 40% of species, so they, they had a good sample of about 8,000 species, um, actually the, the trends from eBird actually agree with, uh, uh, with the trends from bird life, um, which doesn't look great. It seemed to be about the same, depending on whether, you know, temperate or tropical or across the earth. Um, and then Perhaps more concerningly, uh, the agreement was way worse when you looked at species that were actually thought to be, you know, at different levels of threat. So this doesn't really bode too well for citizen science data giving us accurate population trends. Um, but of course, the world isn't just birds. Um, and there's various other citizen science programs going on. Um, and indeed, it's mostly oceans. And so this kind of brings me to my work here at uh, Scripps uh, with Bryce. Um, where we started looking at um, really leveraging data from the Reef Foundation. Um, so the Reef Foundation has what possibly could be, I don't really know, but it possibly could be one of the best um, sort of biodiversity data sets assembled for you know, at least coastal ecosystems now um, through this first fish survey project. So this project and the Reef has basically began in about 1993. Um, principally in the Florida Keys and the Caribbean, um, but now have records and surveys globally. Uh, there's a massive amount of data in, in, uh, in their data set. Uh, they have over 250,000 surveys across 15,000 sites around the world um, with contributions from thousands of divers within just the tropical Western Atlantic, so like the Caribbean and, and sort of uh, southwards, there's 8 million species sighting records um, and 170,000 surveys. So this is magnitudes greater than any of those other data sets we were looking at, several magnitudes greater, um, and potentially in a really useful resource um, to actually start leveraging to get at you know, how actually these ecosystems are changing. So Reef sort of began here. This is the Florida Keys, um, very important ecosystem, largest, uh, basically the only barrier reef in North America, third largest in the world. Um, huge draw for tourism, um, huge uh, uh, sort of e ecosystem that ha provides a lot of benefits. Um, people go diving here all the time. Uh, and so it has this sort of very large importance. And there's a very uh, great number of records now that are, have accumulated here as a result. Um, it's also an ecosystem that has, seems to be going through some pretty uh, drastic changes over the past several decades. Um, so some studies have shown that, yeah, the, the percent of coral cover um, across different parts of uh, the Florida Keys um, seems to have declined quite a bit over the past several decades. Um, like in this study here, as you can see, uh, mostly in terms of the uh, different, not less so the patch reefs and more of these offshore reefs. 
Um, this picture, I don't know how <laughs> representative it is of the entire uh, ecosystem, but it doesn't exactly paint a great picture. So this is one of those places where, you know, ecologically super important dealing with the impacts of hum humans. Um, and it's also a place that, you know, we as humans are directly using as well. So there's really a massive amount of importance to figure out, you know, what's actually going on in a place like this. And very conveniently for my purposes in terms of, you know, whether or not we can actually use uh, the citizen science data to infer population trends. Um, there's been long-term structured systematic monitoring um, conducted by the Southeast Science uh, Fisheries Science Center in NOAA um, that has been operating for decades now. So going back to 1978, um, where they've been conducting these uh, visual censuses of the coral reef fish and the habitat um, in across the Florida Keys and more recently in dry tortugas as well. So this survey self follows, you know, a sort of traditional structured survey design. They have stratified random sampling across the different sort of strata of the reef, um, as indicated here in this map. And essentially what they do is, you know, they, they sort of randomly select um, these sort of grid cells. These are the primary plots. Um, they send out a pair of divers um, to conduct a, a couple subsamples within each grid cell. These are about 200 by 200 meter. And the pair of divers sort of go down. Um, they sort of count every fish they observe um, in a sort of 15 meters radius plot. Um, and they do that for about 15 to 20 minutes as well as collecting some other data. So they have counts of all the different fish species that um, they're seeing uh, in those places. Um, this is very different than the sort of data that, well, not very different, but potentially very different than the data that's getting collected um, by recreational divers in reef. So just to think about this, because it you know, becomes important when we actually start comparing these, um, you know, in RVC, it's stationary. You have a, a direct plot. You're only observing what's in that radius. Um, you have a set time limit, um, and you're sort of randomly conducting these uh, uh, plots across different cells. In reef, um, people are moving around, you're roving, it's non-stationary. Um, time varies, sometimes people are down there for 30 minutes, sometimes they're down there for two hours. Uh, dive locations are recorded, so they say what site they went to. We don't really know fine scale where they went within a site, um, but the survey effort is very variable across sites and across different surveys as well. And um, rather than getting counts, um, the data is sort of summarized in these relative abundant ranks. So either, you know, you saw one something, two to 10, one to 100, or over 100. Um, so different data, but we can potentially still work with those. And quite conveniently, um, we can put up all the different sampling plots of where RBC has been conducting their surveys uh, and the various sites where uh, reef people have surveyed. Um, so this is in the Key Largo area where I'm going to focus uh, for this. Um, there's a lot of data just here. Um, so about 2,400 RBC plots um, compared to about 160 reef dive sites. Uh, different number of survey records across each. So, you know, in, in reef data, people are revisiting sites over and over again. In RBC data, they're sampling one plot once in a year. So it's slightly different in that regard. Um, but they're right basically in the exact same place. Uh, very good spatial overlap at, and, and at the same time frame. So we're comparing this from 1993 uh, to 2018. And basically we're, we're trying to you know, create a time series from this data. Um, so going back to our sort of example time series. So we have you know, our abundance in a given year, which uh, changes based on the growth rate. If we take the log of everything, then it just becomes, so XT being log N, um, we have the previous year plus this growth rate. So growth can be due to different things or rather changes in the abundance that we measure year to year can be due, due to different things. Um, initially, I sort of painted it as purely demographic. And that is of course, one part of it is that, you know, there are births and deaths that are responding to the environment or demographic stochasticity that causes actual population change and we can call this the sort of process variance component of, of temporal change. But then there's another component and that's just observation error. And measuring animal abundance is really hard. Um, so every time we try and actually survey the true abundance, this XT here, 
There's also some additional error that's essentially white noise, so extra just like fluctuations from year to year caused by just random chance of not measuring it correctly. So the, together, these two things can kind of form the overall trend that we see. Um, but what we can start asking is, OK, well, can we actually tease apart these two sources of variance from this model to get at the underlying population change? And this becomes interesting because when we have two time series, we can actually see whether or not they seem to come out of the same underlying state, so from the same XT, or from different ones. So we can formalize this in this model. So basically, we're saying, OK, you have two time series now, two of these Ys, so this one and this one. They might come from the same underlying state. One of them might be offset a little bit, so maybe it's always lower because whatever uh, some thing of your survey design, but then they also have their own separate measurement errors, but they're measuring the same underlying population state. Or you could be from two separate states. So actually, they're not measuring the same thing. There's two different underlying populations fluctuating. So we can basically build these models um, and assess based on the likelihood whether it fits better with one state uh, where these observations are coming from, or whether it's two separate states. So we did this um, for what ended up being about 86 um, different reef associated fish species from a very uh, diverse set. So here's just a, some of them um, in Key Largo from 1993 to 2018. Um, and we basically built models for each of these, these uh, data sets to, to compare them. So the first thing we were mindful of um, were these potential sort of lurking biases. Um, so for RV, the Reef Visual Census data set, um, there's not as many because it's randomized and you know the, the, it's structured, so there's that to take into account of. But um, there are differences in habitat classes. Obviously, some species prefer other one ha habitat type over another. These are the sort of four that we distilled them down to, um, either patch reef, spring root, contiguous reef, or, or rubble. Um, so we kind of fit an effective habitat class and also depth that the plot gets taken at. So that's sort of the only thing we do for RBC. And the reason why we do this is because this changes from year to year. So the proportion of habitats um, just ends up being different. So it's important to take that account in case they happen to sample more of rubble or something in a given year. In reef, there's a lot more to take into account. So there's the actual diver the, um, that made an observation. Um, some people might overestimate abundance, some might underestimate it, some maybe they need glasses. Uh, there's the sites that people visit, so some sites are just going to have more fish than others, the habitat class as well. And then there's also these temporal clusters, which is like, okay, a whole bunch of divers went out on the same day and to the same site, and they all reported what they found. Um, so we need to take that into account, um, or else that could really skew our, our estimates. And then there's all these sort of different covariates that, that could just influence detection, so things like depth, bottom time, um, visibility, whether that observer was an expert or novice. Um, but we can build all this into how we analyze it. So what we did was we constructed um, essentially these Bayesian hierarchical state space models. Um, for reef, it's you know relatively simple. Um, so basically, we're we're looking at the individual survey records, and we're saying, okay, these counts are drawn from a negative binomial distribution, so there's over dispersion because there's tons of zeros. Um, and there's going to be effect of habitat and effect of depth, but then there's also an effect of year. So this alpha T here. Alpha T is essentially our sort of abundance. So this is the expected number of, of individuals of that species that you would encounter on a given year. And we can say that this alpha T, so this intercept based on the year, um, grows out of the true population abundance plus some measurement error. And that true population abundance behaves like any population where it's growing from its previous cohort plus some demographic change. So that's our reef visual census model. The reef data, because it's in this relative abundance category, um, we have to do sort of like an ordinal model, ordered logistics. So we're trying to predict the probability of, of these different relative abundance classes. And we're modeling this sort of latent variable, this Y star, um, that is basically, uh, essentially the underlying true ab ab abundance that causes uh, the observations to get slotted into these different categories. So we define these cut points and then these end up becoming probabilities for each of these relative abundance classes. So to model the, the sort of underlying abundance, we also have all these covariates for the things that we want to take into account, so site, diver, um, all these things. So these are essentially random effects. 
And we also have um, our year effect. So the expected mean sort of probability for a given year that does the same thing. So it, it comes from this underlying population state um, that itself is changing through time. And we can basically take both of these models then. So we, we, we are estimating these jointly and we can ask whether this sort of year effect for each one um, comes from either a combined state, so they both have the same XT, and therefore both of these are influenced by that same one with some correction factor, or whether there's two separate ones. And we can then kind of sort of actually compare these two models. So I'll, I'll walk you through this um, with an example. So here's Yellowhead Ras and Key Largo. Um, so here's a combined population state. So the red dots here, um, that's the reef sort of estimate of abundance. So that's um, essentially like our observed. And the dashed line is the estimated underlying population state. The shaded area represents the 90% confidence interval. Uh, RVC is in blue, so this is the observed. And then there's our dashed line. As you can see, they, they're perfectly symmetric because this is from the combined state. So it's basically saying, okay, so this is what's happening together for both of them. And then all these observations that are above or below is just measurement error, basically. So we just happen to have a good year on it here and then happen to have some bad years here in terms of measuring it. But that these are actually showing us the same underlying population trajectory. Or we can compete a different model. So now they have their own separate um, states. As you can see, the state fits really closely now um, to the reef data. So it's actually saying, OK, no, most of this fluctuation is probably demographic, not observation error, like here. Um, and then the RBC data is also doing its own separate thing. So this is essentially what the model is producing for us uh, after taking into account all those other factors. And it's quite remarkable. Um, in many cases, they agree really, really well. Um, here's just four examples of so bicolor damselfish. You can see that like even these like little pulses um, are being captured in the same way. Same here with nurse, nurse shark. So, so what seems to be some sort of like bits of population growth and bits of population decline seem to be being captured in both of these surveys, which is quite reassuring. Um, and some other examples over here with the four butterfly fish and uh, fowl fish. Um, yes, I will admit, Cherry picked some nice ones uh, just to show. Um, so what does it actually look like if we perform some model selection? So we try and predict um, the actual data points themselves to see which model fits better. And based on that, what we found is that actually the combined population trajectory, so sharing that same population state, was the best support model for nearly 80% of, of species. Um, so a huge improvement uh, from the other study with eBird. Um, that suggests some really good congruence between both of these surveys. Interestingly, uh, about 18 of these surveys had these separate population states. Um, here's one, for example, with uh, black grouper. Um, and these are ones that I kind of want to focus on because I think they're uh, the, the sort of exceptions to the rule are, end up being far more interesting. Here's a few of them. Um, so again, reef is in the red and RVC uh, is in the blue. What we start noticing is that uh, there seems to be some very systematic differences in, in the trends that we're estimating. Uh, in reef data, we're capturing what seem to be pretty big declines in a number of fish species that are not being observed in, in the RBC data set. So this is true in rock beauty, yellow stingray, uh, this butter hamlet here, reef butterfly fish. These are all suggesting, based on the citizen science data, that uh, actually things have declined pretty badly uh, for these species. Uh, RBC, though, is, is essentially flat. So we're curious whether this actually means that there potentially is some sort of bias towards the citizen science data. And if you actually plot these out, so these are the annual trend rates um, for the RBC data versus the reef on the Y. This uh, solid line is the one-to-one -one line, so that's like the complete agreement. And uh, these dashed lines sort of show you the different quadrats. What's kind of weird is that there's a whole bunch of species where they're either sort of stable or slightly increasing according to the RBC data set, um, whereas they are declining in reef. Um, which one is, the, is, is more accurate um, and a better representation of reality? Uh, we can't ever be sure, but we can sort of somewhat assess this. Uh, if we go back to our sort of state space framework, um, we can essentially boil down the fluctuations into either process or observation variants, 
And ideally, you want a time series that's capturing more you know, process variance rather than observation variance. So we can use a sort of proportion of temporal variance that's attributed of total temporal variance, so that's both the Q plus the R, um, that's attributed to process. So that's actually demographic change. So this gives us maybe a, a bit of a, a metric of like how well each of these methods is actually tracking um, the, the true underlying population state. So this is what it looks like if you actually compare the, the proportion of these things across uh, for the same species. So these are the 86 species across RBC and reef. Um, and it's sort of hard to see from here, uh, but generally what seems to be happening is that the reef data actually, the, so the citizen science data actually has a higher proportion of its variance attributed to process. Um, so actual you know, demographic change. Indeed, 75% of them had greater process, a greater proportional process error uh, variance in the citizen science data set um, with the differences shown here in this histogram. So only a very small subsection actually seemed to be better captured um, by the RBC survey. So I just wanna show you, given how we started this talk, um, the sort of inferences we'd gain from these 86 species about you know, how this ecosystem is doing based on these two data sets. So this is what the annual distribution of annual trends looks like uh, for RBC. Um, based on you know 95% confidence intervals of the trends, you'd say about 6% of them are significantly declining. So those would be those ones out here. 26% you know, have some evidence of decline, but maybe it overlaps with zero. The mean trend is actually a slight increase of 25% gain over 26 years. Reef tells a very different story. Um, 70% of these 86 species have potentially declined. 31% showed significant declines. Um, and the average change in populations was about, you know, minus 36% over 26 years. These are very different influences about how this ecosystem is doing. Um, and given what I just showed you in terms of, you know, how much the temporal variance is being attributed to either process or observation error, um, maybe that suggests that things are, this is perhaps a more realistic picture of what's going on in Key Largo. Okay, so with that, um, I, I want you to leave with the impression that we actually really don't have a good grasp on on how you know population, species, and biodiversity generally is changing um, through time for most of Earth's ecosystems. We only have a really small glimpse into this at the moment. Um, I think citizen science data is the only way to actually address this at scale. Um, and it's really going to be crucial to fill this biodiversity data gap um, if it's useful. Uh, certainly, at least comparing the reef citizen science fish surveys um, to structured surveys, it seems like the population trajectories are mostly in agreement, so that's very reassuring. Um, and maybe, uh, we can't really say for sure, but maybe these citizen science time series are actually going to be more accurate in some cases than structured surveys. And perhaps uh, even reveal these maybe cryptic demographic changes. Okay, with that, um, lots of people to thank. Uh, first for the sort of Living Planet Index stuff, uh, I'd like to thank um, my main co-authors who we started this project with, which was Brian Leung and Anna Hargreaves at McGill, um, but also a huge thanks to the people um, who assembled and contributed to this data set uh, at the Living Planet. And they make it uh, openly available. They're actually really great. And indeed, we actually collaborated uh, with some of their uh, staff on that project. Um, so they're really open to um, you know, sharing data and working with us, which was really amazing. Uh, thanks also to Bryce and Christy and Jeremiah, um, who all uh, you know, made this uh, citizen science analysis possible. And of course, all the people who contributed and curate Reef uh, and also Noah who made um, the RPC data set available. And that is it, and I'm happy to take any questions. That's awesome, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. I actually have a question, but it looks like other people have beat me to the punch. Um, just a moment. Let's see. Uh, so Erica Burr says she apologized. She had to leave uh, a little early today, but but thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. And it's so cool how you put all this together. Um, and then Kayla Blanco says, it looked like all the fish above the one 
oh, above the one-to-one -one line in the RVC versus reef were all parrotfish. Do you think that's by chance or is there some sort of parrotfish bias in the reef data? Side note, congrats on parsing the variance. <laughs> yes, parsing the variance was a hard fought battle <laughs> um, that few will appreciate. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I I I don't know. Um, it's quite possible. Like I don't know. Maybe people. I, I really don't know enough about the species or like how the how this data would sort of get generated to really answer that in, in detail. I suspect that it's, that it's probably true though that like yeah, there's going to be certain species that maybe divers are even seeking out or that just become. Or, or they're they're preferentially going to like the best possible habitats for them. I don't know if that would be necessarily be the true um, for these this particular set of species, but I could imagine like you know parrotfish seem like a very charismatic sort of fauna, um, and and again citizen science data is going to have more biases towards things that humans like for whatever reason, be it in a site, be it in a, a habitat type, be it a species. So it's quite possible that that is a reflection of some sort of like intrinsic human bias to trying to find those species and therefore the abundance is being estimated to be like even higher. Yeah, I actually have a follow up question um, to that. So what did, did Jeremiah from NOAA have any insight as to what perhaps is going on with those species surveys, the NOAA species surveys or the RVC surveys in which Reef did a better job at, at you know, with capturing the, the process variants. Um, I can't speak to that because I literally just got these results like a couple of days ago. So it's really, really hot off the, off the R press. Um, I mean, I think that like, so one of the places I'll go with this is, is actually trying to figure out, okay, you know, what species level factors maybe influence um, how much process to uh, observation area, area seems to be occurring within each species. Because you can imagine with like a, a stationary plot for 20 minutes, like you're, there's just some species like you, you'll probably like very rarely ever see just because like our big, you know, uh, roaming fish necessarily going to enter that 15 minute meter circular plot are very small, you know, cryptic species. Are you even going to notice them if you have to sit there and like just observe, right? You know, if you have to can't go and look under nooks and crannies. So I suspect that that in many senses, there'll be some systematic biases there. Some earlier work we looked at suggested that, um, for instance, Reef did a much better job, at, like it had a higher proportion of process error for species that were rare. So ones that we rarely encounter, which makes sense, right? Um, because those are those are going to be the ones that yeah people if you are swimming around for you know an hour and a half you're more likely to just catch one at all so it's just going to be dominated by zeros um, with a 20 minute plot and it's a 15 minute meter uh, radius right so there's going to be a lot of things like that I suspect going on um, whether those would create a bias towards like a flat line trend or a positive trend it's hard to say the other thing though is that like there has been some I don't think there's been changes in methodology. There's been changes in how they select sites um, over the course of that 1993 to 2018 period. period. Um, so it was a bit more haphazard prior to 1999. So whether or not that can potentially contributes to it, it could. Um, but I can't really speak directly to that. Thank you. Have you, I know you just, these are sort of hot off the press data, um, but did you kind of think about maybe um, correcting for some of that different fish behavior? Um, or have you thought about maybe doing that? I know it's it's it already tells a, a, a pretty amazing um, story mm -hmm. just as is. So, yeah, I mean, you could, one, uh, one could potentially do that. Um, the, I guess it's whether we want to do that built into the model itself or post hoc. Um, to, to build it into the model, you had to model them all jointly, which would probably just be impossible. Like, it's already a huge bottleneck to even do, like, the, the one set of species with the amount of data. Um, 
So I suspect that unfortunately it will have to be sort of like post hoc rationalization of it rather than trying to like explicitly model, you know, all these behaviors. We did er early on when we were investigating this, we assembled this big sort of like trait data set of like, you know, color, behavior, all these things. Um, so it'll be interesting to revisit that and like take some of these results and actually start plotting that out onto like the trait space of all these species. Um, Cause it probably will reveal some like systematic, you know, differences between the two survey types. Uh, so we have another question from yeah. AJ Walker. Um, he wants to know if you're aware of the Grenion Greeters program conducted by Dr. Karen Martin um, from Pepperdine, and uh, which is almost totally dependent on trained citizen scientist observations. Would you change any of their methods? Um, so this is my bias as, as like a quantitative person. I'd be like, well, Maybe you don't have to. Like, I guess my experience with this data set is even though this data is, you know, messy, it's un well, it's not untrained. Actually, people are quite, quite um, trained with this uh, uh, conducting these surveys. But I think that there's a remarkable amount of correction that you can do just through modeling, basically, um, taking into account these different factors. So I think it's what maybe is the most important is to keep track of any variable that you think could influence the data that you're getting. So things like effort detection. Um, so in terms of like, like some of the stuff we had was, you know, obviously bottom time, uh, water visibility, um, current was even in there. Uh, having, uh, making sure that each record is associated with a certain uh, trained personnel is super important because that helps, you know, correct for the fact that, you know, Bob sees more of this and, you know, Karen doesn't or whatever. Um, those are all super important things to take into account to like do the post hoc correction. Um, so really, I think it's mostly about trying to set up your data collection so that you have all the tools available to actually, you know, evaluate these things um, rather than changing like specific ways in terms of how you, you know, teach people to go do something. I think it's more just about having those, that data available so that you can always account for it. At least that's how I would, my biased view sort of uh, goes towards it, yeah. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let's see. Well, um, we have one more minute if anybody has a pressing question. Um, otherwise, we'll just sort of hang on and um, kind of chat informally. Uh, if you want to ask Dan about any other questions you might have, maybe even unrelated to this talk, or just dive a little bit deeper um, in, into all of what he shared with us, that would be great too. Um, we'll be hanging on here for, um, I don't know, another maybe 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so. Let's see. Um, oh, um, Martha Kalitsky from Reef. She says, great talk, Dan. Thanks for digging into the Reef data. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for helping get that data. <laughs> uh, okay. Kale, Kale says frogs are fish. I'm gonna go with frogfish. <laughs> the peak of evolution. 